it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jordan Sugai. Um, Dr. Sugai is a renowned professor at the Mayak School of Education at the University of Connecticut. He has an expertise in behavior analysis, classroom behavior management, school-wide positive behavior support, and students with emotional behavioral disorders. He's been a public school teacher and a residential treatment program director. He conducts applied research in schools and works to translate research into practice. He's currently co-director of both the Center on Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports and the Early Childhood Personnel Center, as well as a research scientist at the Center on Behavioral Education Research. Uh, on a personal note, I've known Dr. Sugai for several, over several years and I found him to be a genuine, kind person, very humble, and a lifelong learner who's dedicated to improving positive outcomes for children and adolescents in the schools. So I can introduce Dr. Sugai. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Great. Everything started out so formal and solemn that I figured it kind of lightened up a little bit here. Um, it's a great honor to be here, and I thank the family and all of you who have been participating in this, setting this event up for this opportunity. Uh, it's very humbling to be part of something like a lecture dedicated to somebody who's so powerful as Benjamin Clough was. So I really do appreciate the opportunity to be here. Let me see if I can turn this on now. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so my job is to give you some things to think about in the context of the lecture and the kind of legacy that Benjamin uh, Clough has provided us. And I'm going to share with you some thoughts about some of the work that I do and hopefully how this might relate to your own lives. I know some of you in here are part of education, some of you are not. Some of you are special educators, some of you are school psychs, some of you do different kinds of things, some are students and so forth. So I'm going to try to do as best I can to try to go down the middle and give you some things to think about. Uh, first of all, a couple disclaimers. One is that I've uh, been across a number of different places. I've been in Kuwait last week, I was in Jamaica the week before, and my sinuses are all kind of messed up. So if I snort, sneeze, make funny noises, just I apologize up front. So a blanket apology, so I won't have to keep apologizing for the morning. I know it will happen. Um, but I'm, I feel pretty good, so that's, that's a good thing. Um, Second of all, um, I want, want you also to know that I had a chance to walk around the camp, beautiful campus, and I had a mistake. I found the campus creamery, and um, it was really good. So I'm kind of on a little bit of a sugar high and a little bit of a high fat content kind of an experience here. So we'll see how this goes. So first of all, <clears throat> I just want to acknowledge the planning committee, the dean, Clough family, and so forth. I uh, really do appreciate this chance to come and present. You need to know this is a very important event. I, as Rob O'Neill and Paul know, I don't normally wear ties, so this is a big deal. Uh, so I really do appreciate the chance to be here. I also want to make sure that you understand that uh, I have had a long career in what I do, and much of what I have done has been because of the people I work with. And as I like to tease, I am the mouth for my center, I'm the mouth for my department, I'm the mouth for the, a lot of the things that we've been able to accomplish. Because I've learned a lot from students, I've learned a lot from educators, I've learned a lot from the communities within my work. So it was very gracious to kind of bring me here, but you're really kind of honoring a collection of people who've shaped who I am. And I'm going to try to, to address that as we go. Uh, let's see, maybe this is, uh, there we go. So first of all, just a little plug for you. The materials I'm going to share with you, you can find at this site. Uh, I'm very lucky. I co-direct the National Center on Positive Behavioral Supports. It's been around for 20 years now, and uh, it's a pretty dense site. There's lots of material there around supporting families, students, schools, states, and so forth. Uh, we're trying to create positive pilots, positive environments for the children to learn how to navigate school as well as how to navigate the social climate that's around them. And these materials, if you're interested, you can go to by clicking on presentations and you can get everything I'm going to share with you uh, this morning. In fact, you may leave now because everything I am going to share with you is at that site. <laughs> we'll get it in little time if you prefer. Okay. Uh, way back in the fall when I was asked to do this presentation, I had this idea that I'd like to be able to talk, describe you know, how I came to be. I was going to talk about events and people and experiences that have shaped who I am. And I'm still going to do that. But in recent months, things have happened around the country, around the world, that have uh, forced me to say, you know, I'd like to talk more about issues that are pressing. 
And I'd like to be able to describe some, some thoughts around school violence, school safety, around prevention, and so forth. I'd like us to think as individuals, you know, what, what role do we play in trying to shape the experiences for future generations of children who come through our school system? So I am going to switch a little bit on the focus, and I, uh, you might want to, uh, may want to leave now if that's not what you want to hear, but I do feel like it's pretty important to kind of share this content. I still will describe the influences that have shaped who I am, uh, because they do influence how I'm going to interpret some of the things I'm going to describe for you. Uh, I do believe there's some urgency in some of the messages I want to share, some things I've been learning from different places that I've been working. Uh, recent, um, recent months, recent years, there's been a fair amount of tragedy in a number of our public schools, universities, and communities. And I want to share with you some thoughts about how our current work has, uh, might have a role to play in trying to shape some of that activity. Um, I also should say to you that uh, there was a little goodie bag in my room last night, uh, and Brigham Young made this quote at the very top about the role of education, so I added it this morning. I think it has a direct application to what we're here for. And I just want us to kind of remember that education serves a very important role in helping shape our students' experiences inside of schools, <laughs> and, as well as here at the university. Uh, Benjamin Clough also, I did my homework, I went and Googled his name to make sure I knew everything about him and the family. And one of the quotes that came out of that search was this thing, learn to do by doing. And I thought about that because it has a whole lot to do with my growing up to be who I am. Much of who I am is because of the things I've done. Much of what who I am is because of the things I've done and how others have responded to it. Much of who I am is because of what I've done and other people have taught me about what I could do differently. So I think his legacy, his, his experiences, relates to this, this lecture as well as some of the materials I'm going to try to share with you. So to start off, just to give you a little bit of a looser kind of setup, I want to give you a little bit of context for the remaining second half of the presentation. First of all, you need to know you're a long way away. Uh, you're one flight. Uh, it was amazing to me. Uh, the flight was full. There was a waiting list. There were a whole bunch of people with ski boots coming here. And I realized there was not a lot of snow at some of your, your resorts. So I hope they found enough snow to be able to ski. But I also noticed that the same plane, plane was on its way to Hawaii next. So I think it's, uh, anyway, okay. <laughs> I also want you to know a little bit about where I am. I'm in the third smallest state. I live in Connecticut. Uh, all those yellow arrows represent places that I've lived, worked, and so forth. And I, I share those only because I've done things on these states, and those experiences, again, have shaped much of what I'm going to share with you today. Uh, I was describing someone earlier, uh, before we started, that I'm a third generation Japanese American. I was born in, who, who knows what Santa Cruz, California was? That's why I was born. Uh, Beach Boys, Boardwalk, Big Dipper, that's me, all right? Uh, my parents were born in Watsonville. Who knows who's been to Watsonville? Part of Joe Capital of the World. Um, that's where my parents were born. And my grandparents came over from Japan. Uh, my, father, my grandfather actually came over by himself to work on the railroads and on the farms. And my grandmother is a mail order bride. She was sent over to my grandfather, sight unseen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. And um, so anyway, that's, that's, that's why I'm a third generation Japanese American. Um, and I worked at the University of Oregon, went to school at the University of Washington, taught at the University of Kentucky, uh, did some treatment work up in New Hampshire, and, um, and so forth. But I currently live in Connecticut. And as my wife says, you know, I've been unstable, not able to kind of survive in any one place, so I've been moving around quite a bit. But uh, I'm probably going to retire in Connecticut. That's where Connecticut is, Hartford's the capital. Um, and if you don't know where Hartford is, that's how it relates to these other big cities. Just so you kind of know, we've moved. I used to live in Connecticut, I just moved there in August to Massachusetts because my wife's uh, father is, lives in Boston, so we want to be closer to him. Um, but I live in, I'm really close to Boston, New York, and Washington, D.C., so I, it's a really neat place to be able to live. Uh, you're welcome to come and visit me anytime you like. We have one guest bedroom. <laughs> uh, and stores. Connecticut is where the University of Connecticut is. That's where I work and uh, locate my center. It's out in the green pastures. It's out in the country. Uh, there's about mm, 30,000 students who go there out in the country. And we're about 45 minutes away from Hartford. And that's the School of Education. Um, if anybody would like to transfer to our university, just let me know. I'm here to recruit <laughs> uh, for our non-program message. 
Uh, and my office is in the basement on the other side of that building. I'm not sure why they put me in the basement. Well, I think I know why they put me in the basement. But uh, we have our, my center is located on the uh, north side of the building. Brand new building uh, uh, named after the Nieg family and for whom I've been lucky enough to have a, uh, a chair named after. Okay. So this, I'm going to do in one slide in one minute what I was going to do the whole time for the presentation, but I've shifted. I do feel obligated to kind of share with you a little bit about my history. You need to understand that, or know, know that I was a biology major in undergraduate school, although I wanted to be a botanist. Uh, if you were, grew up in the 60s, you'll know that that was the time of the Vietnam War, and hippies, and ecology, environmentalism, and I wanted to work with redwood trees and so forth. Not with people, but with trees. But I had a job as a Easter Seal camp, uh, camp, camp a counselor, and I decided to shift after I started working with kids with disabilities. And I um, was learning a whole lot about education through that particular experience. Then I became a special educator, went up to the University of Washington to learn about precision teaching, about something called applied behavior analysis. A bunch of people influenced who I, who I am, again, because they trained me on what best practice might look like and working with kids with, within special education. Um, my graduate work was with a whole bunch of other really smart people who taught me about development disabilities and autism, taught me about what it meant to create environments that were safe and caring for kids, trying to find more positive ways, preventative ways to work with kids with disabilities and challenges. And I'm forever grateful to these individuals because they taught me much about what it means to work with schools, families, and children. Uh, most recently, however, uh, I've been working very much in trying to understand how systems operate, school systems in particular, uh, individual schools, classrooms, school districts, states, uh, how school mental health interacts with special education, school psychology, and so forth. And we've been building some work around trying to create safe and caring learning environments for children, staff members, and families. And much of our work is being focused on things called prevention and the behavioral sciences, Try to build places that are more respectful and caring for, for kids as they go through their educational experience. And that's what I've spent the last probably 20 years of my life doing, is trying to think about how we apply what we've learned in working with individual kids to how we work with school systems. And I'm going to try to share with you some thoughts about how these different experiences shape who I am. I'm really lucky. I'm a trained special educator. Uh, however, I work with a whole bunch of different disciplines. I really liked what I've experienced already this morning working with school psychologists and counseling um, and general education as well. Uh, we've been working with school resource officers and physical therapists and nurses, bless you, and some other different uh, disciplines. And it's been really helpful to kind of understand how everybody works together and try to address this problem. Now, I've purposely set this up in this way because I want you to think about what's been happening in our schools and communities over the last three or four or five years with this, in the sense of school safety school climate, school violence, and so forth. All right, so why, why am I so focused on schools? Somebody was asking me earlier, you know, how can you keep your focus on schools so strong enough to keep going? It's, it's a very frustrating job in many ways. And what we found is that schools is a really important investment. Schools, public schools in particular, are places where kids spend, you know, 12 or more of their years they spend 180 days of a year with some other adults other than their parents. They uh, have a chance for six hours a day to learn how to read, write, do math, learn history, and so forth. Very powerful places. In fact, kids during those 12 years spend more time with other adults than they do with their parents in many, in many cases because of the kind of learning experiences that occur. And for us, that means that we have a significant responsibility and obligation provide experiences for kids inside of public schools that equip them to be able to navigate the world. What happens when they take jobs, what happens when they move out to communities, what happens when they start families. We in schools, public schools in particular, have an opportunity to build their capacity or confidence to be successful in those kind of experiences. And that's particularly true now. Now when there's so many significant barriers, roadblocks, challenges that are happening. Our kids are growing up now in a very violent kind of social community, and they're experiencing things that are very difficult to navigate. And somehow we need to become much more formal in our approach to trying to help kids be more successful, families as well. So I just, uh, two days ago, uh, IES, the uh, Institute for Education Science, came out with a couple of reports. 
that seem to be relevant to this particular conversation that I'm having with you today. I just briefly want to make, kind of back up what I just said with some, if you will, research. Um, there was a, uh, a group in IES that does these regular surveys of kids across the United States. And they sampled some 12 to 18 year olds about their perceptions about school. And one of the big messages that came out of that report is regardless of the perception of crime in their school or community, high or low, whatever, regardless of their perception, most kids identify schools as being someplace they want to be. They feel like it's safe, they feel like they're respected, and so forth. So schools play an important role in children's experiences because they feel like it's a place they can go to and feel like they can be safe, even in the context of what's happening now. They've also said they're more likely to feel safe at school if they have an adult or student that they have access to, that they can talk to, that they can share their feelings with, that they can report being bullied, if you will, or victimized. So kids are going to feel safer at school if they have a significant other for whom they can identify within those schools. Who do I think that is? That's us as teachers. That's us as school administrators. That's us as counselors and psychologists. So I'm trying to make the case that schools have an important role in our community in order to enable our students to be successful because they perceive these places as places to be safe and to be supported. So what have we done in the past? Prior to 2016 or so, there have been a number of different initiatives at the federal level to try to help create those safe and caring environments. I've been in a good, lucky position to be able to work with these initiatives around safe schools, how to address the school to prison pipeline, how to focus on school behavioral health. Those are all topics that are pretty important to us. And a lot of these initiatives have been put in place to try to solve the problems that are out there as well as to create those environments that I just described for you. Prior to 2016, they, uh, Education for Student, Every, Student, Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, came out. There's been an attempt to try to continue that work on the school climate and multi-tier systems. We're still trying to figure out how to operationalize that particular law now, and we're trying to figure out how that, how that comes to bear in some of the challenges that we have now. Now, I'm not sure if this is true in Utah, but in other places, it's a problem. And I've been doing this work now for about 30 years. So the fascinating thing is, I started out doing this work because schools were being too punishing. There was too much rack and management going on. 30 years later, it's still an issue in our schools. Right now, there are about 20 schools across the United States that still have on the books. It's legal to use corporal punishment for children who violate the code of conduct in school, meaning swaps with paddocks, literally. And of those 20, half of them still practice paddling as a consequence for school-based violations. And we've, we've learned already that those kinds of consequences are not very effective in trying to solve the problems that our kids present. We've also been struggling with the levels of intimidation, harassment, and bullying that are occurring in our schools. And much of the work that our center does and the people that I work with is trying to create environments where those kinds of behaviors are no longer possible or are no longer are occurring and that we reduce the likelihood of them being developed over time. Oops, let me back up. And we're still struggling with schools being fairly negative in their climate, or how they are perceived or experienced. If you walk into a school that has this sign, it just kind of causes one to think twice about whether or not this is going to be a fun experience or not. You know, you walk through those gates and you get these messages about no guns, no drugs, no sex, no rock and roll, and you wonder about, you know, how, what are these environments going to look like? What's interesting is I was talking to the dean of students that has signs similar to this up front of their schools, and he said, what's your problem? I said, well, it's not a very welcoming place. He says, but we have a welcome sign in the left-hand corner. You know, as if that's going to be sufficient to, to try to change the perception that people have. And now, in many of our states, this picture was taken from Texas, we're now having to deal with some other variable that's trying to affect our school environments. My wife is a school, was a school principal. She retired two years ago, uh, just after the Sandy Hook event happened. We live about 45 minutes away from Sandy Hook. The superintendent told all the principals of her district that they would have to take gun safety training courses and consider putting a gun in their office, right? As a response to the shooting at Sandy Hook. Now, I've lived with my wife for 30-something years, 38, I should, I should know that, right? 38 years. 
I'm not so sure it'd be a good idea to put a gun in her hands, you know? <laughs> and she admits that that's not a good idea either, you know? And you gotta really think twice about, you know, what kinds of responses are we making uh, in, in reaction to some of the things that are occurring around the country? So a little bit more for you. This came out this month as well. I just want to share with you because it talks about a little bit about bullying. And the interesting thing is over the last, uh, what, um, eight or nine years or so, bullying rates have actually dropped. <coughs> Not at significant rates, but at least dropped. This is based on student verbal reports. And the number of hate-related words happening inside of schools have also dropped. But the question becomes, what's happening after, post two, after 2016? Because I'm going to share some data with you in a second but that says, you know what, that trend might change after 2016. In that same report, they talk about, you know, there's been a decrease in bullying, but decrease in bullying is more likely in schools when those kids who are being victimized have an adult that they can talk to. That goes back to the first report again. So if you want to decrease bullying, one thing that's pretty important is you create an environment where adults are accessible, which becomes another characteristic of, of what I want to end with at the end. Again, the question becomes, what's going to happen after 2016 uh, with respect to the data, which uh, I'll try to share some ideas with you in a second. Uh, January 2017, this report came out. It came out at the Southern Poverty Law Center. And what's fascinating about it is just after the election, they surveyed 10,000 educators and they asked them, are you seeing any differences in your kids or your school climate as a result of the election? Now, this is all correlational self-report, so you can squint and kind of take this as you can see fit. But after the 2016 election, of the 10,000 educators, 90% reported a change in climate towards a more negative environment. And then they started asking, how come? And some of the rhetoric that was being said at the national level and the debates and so forth, so we're starting to show up inside the schools, around immigration and so forth. And so it became something pretty significant for us to address. And within, and within those reports, they found that schools were very specific about the things that they were experiencing. <coughs> Negative mood, anxiety, stuff around their derogatory language, and harassment, harassment. Uh, my wife was working in a school, and a second grader came up to her, and she, the little second grader was crying. And so well, Betsy asked her, you know, why are you upset? What can we do? And the second grader said, I'm sorry, I may not be able to come back to school tomorrow. And Betsy said, well, why are you afraid to come back to school tomorrow? She goes, well, I'm not afraid. It's just that my mother and I might be asked to leave the country. So we've got kids who are experiencing stuff that causes them to come to school, and now we're asking them to sound out these letters. You know, we're asking them to solve problems responsibly. And they're coming to school with these kinds of experiences. Uh, so the poverty law said, I just looked this up in March 18th, in fact. There's been a significant drop in hate groups around the country up until about 2014, and there's been a steady increase. And as in March, there were 954 hate groups, which are defined as well-established, you can find them online, sites that have specific agenda to, in my, in my language, discriminate against certain groups around the country. <clears throat> why, I, why do I worry about this? Is because those groups have an effect now and they're becoming much more visible and they're affecting schools, families, communities, and so forth. I can't speak to Utah, I don't know, but I know that nationally these kinds of events are having an impact on education and families. If you look at those 954 hate groups around, around the country as of January 2017, <coughs> excuse me, what you'll find is they're kind of uh, uh, distributed not equally across the United States. But there are, there's one at least in every state in the union. Um, there's been an increase since 2017 in these established hate groups that have specific agenda against specific ethnic groups, racial groups, religions, and so forth. And again, it's trying to, it makes a statement about the kind of community in which our kids are growing up and our families are growing up. Just so you kind of know, Utah is in great shape. <laughs> you only have three, supposedly, groups that have an open you know, agenda trying to hold back certain particular groups. California, interestingly, has gone up. There are 75 of these specific hate groups, KKK and others. Uh, Texas, Florida, the top three. And New England, where I live, I clumped them all together because we're small states, have 33 of these particular groups. And what I worry about about all this is that we're seeing increases in this stuff happening inside our schools and communities. 
And again, I'm painting the bad picture right now, and I'm going to finish up with, you know, what can we do as a community as a whole to try to address these problems. It doesn't do any good to turn away and blow your nose and have a mic on. That's what I do. I was at the University of New Hampshire doing some work, and on the day that I was there, a letter came out from the president with a statement about the un unacceptability of swastikas being drawn in the hallway of a particular dormitory. So our universities are being affected by this as well. Now, a little side note. This is personal, so you can just kind of ignore me if you choose to. I just want you to know that, you know, what was happening back in the 1940s has some feel to what's happening now with respect to immigration, different racial groups, and so forth. In 1942, my family, who I told you was born in California, my grandparents who came over from Japan, they were all interned in camps because they were Japanese American. My mother had a California birth certificate, as did my dad, and we, they were interned. They spent two and a half years in prison in the camp in, in the deserts of Arizona, Nevada, California, and so forth, uh, because they were Japanese. And there was a pretty strong sentiment against the Japanese Americans at that time. And if you can cross off the word Jap and put in other words there that are current today, and we worry about those kinds of patterns. If you grow up in those kinds of environments, it affects how you grow up and the kinds of experiences I've had. I was asked earlier uh, by the grandson of Benjamin Clough, you know, do you speak Japanese? And the answer is no. And the reason I don't speak Japanese is my, my parents went through the camp experience. And they said, speaking Japanese is a negative thing. And we will not teach you to speak Japanese because we don't want you to suffer because you can't speak clean, clear English. Um, the interesting thing also is that not everybody treated the Japanese Americans in the same way. My parents went to camp, but my father and his family packed up trucks and they drove to Utah. And they ended up in Salt Lake City and they were welcomed by the Salt Lake City community and were were uh, provided a place to, to grow, to live, to eat, to, be, uh, to learn how to do jobs, and so forth. And so I had this kind of strong family link to what goes on here in Utah, because you opened your arms up to some people who were escaping, going to prison, if you will, from California. So I appreciate being here for, for that reason in particular. Um, but they were treated not like U.S. citizens, which is kind of the troubling thing. There are, you know, a dozen or so camps. My mother was in Poston. She graduated from high school at, at Poston. Um, they call it camps, I'll say prison, because it was behind Mars Wire and everything. All right, so that's, I wanted to give you a context. And before I go into what next, I want you to answer a question for me. I know a couple of you have done this with me before, so just don't give out the answer if you remember it. But I, I want you to understand why I wanted to do that history, why I wanted to go through the context piece about who I am and how we think about how we're going to struggle with trying to improve the quality of the education experiences of our kids in school because we have an important obligation 180 days a year for 12 years in working with those kids. So here's how this goes. I think Robert Neal actually knows this kid. That's my son. Um, he, he, and I, he was 21 at the time. They had a cross-country bicycle ride. We rode our bicycles from Portland, Oregon to Georgetown on the East Coast, Virginia. And we rode across the United States. We went to a number of states. And we stopped to get some a drink of water. And my son stops, and he sees that sound, and he, sign, and he says to me, how far away is the wood, Dad? How far away is the wood? I had said, no, son. It's not how far away the wood is. They have firewood for sale. Got firewood. Got milk. All right, same idea. Now, my son was born in Eugene, Oregon. Never went further east of the Cascades. He's a Portlandia kid. You know, his, his experiences are relatively narrow, and so forth, you know? But his interpretation of the sign was how far away the wood is. Now, don't answer out loud, answer inside your head. What state were we in when we saw that state? Or saw that sign, I'm sorry. All right? 2001, 2002, 2003. The answer is Maryland. It was at the end of our trip we saw this sign. Now, I'm not inside your head, but I'm willing to predict it. But some of you said Alabama. Some of you said Utah. Some of you said Western Utah. Some of you said Idaho. Whatever you said, right? Some of you have a learning experience that caused you to interpret that experience that we had 
and make an assumption about what that sign meant and where it came from. You know, why did you think it came from eastern Nebraska or, you know, or Mississippi or whatever you thought? You know, why were you surprised that it was Maryland? Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying this to be critical, but our individual learning experiences affect how we interpret what we see, right? What you learn by doing and so forth. You also learn things that might be misrules about how you acquire stuff. So, let me take this a little further. Your learning history, if you're a school person, affects how you respond to children, all right? How many in the room are school principals, used to be, want to be, or whatever? Anybody? Oh good, so I can make fun of you, that's great. <laughs> so that's the school principal right there. And he's in his office, waiting for that next round of kids who have been sent to the office for violating the code of conduct, all right? So you got one girl who's been sent, sent to the office for using the SHIT word, the middle kid has been sent to the office for using the F-U-C-K word, and the third kid has been sent to the office for saying Christmas in class. All right? Each of those, those, those events were separate events experienced by a different teacher, and those teachers chose to make a decision to send the kid to the office for those behaviors. Now, I'm not excusing the behaviors. I don't think they're acceptable, they're inappropriate. But at the same time, one thing you need to understand is that our national data indicates that we are not fair on who sits on that table, on that bench. If you happen to be a kid of color, a boy, and with a disability, you're six to eight times more likely sitting on that bench for the same behavior. Right? Again, I'm not blaming anybody, but our learning histories and our experiences cause us to respond. It's also the fact that the principal has a decision to make, send them back to class, call a parent, expel, suspend, in school detention, that principle also has a decision to make. Right now, we're looking at this problem called the school to prison pipeline. We're concerned about disproportionality in our discipline data. We're worried about kids being sent to special ed more, at a certain rate more than a different group of kids. All those factors have to do with an adult variable, which I like to call their learning histories and their experiences. How you respond to me, how I respond to you are affected by that. Now, why am I spending time on this? Because what I want us to be clear about is much of the problem we're experiencing at the national level or within schools or within classrooms is because of these learning histories that affect how we respond to what we see. And those experiences cause us to have different effects on students with whom we work. Again, their experiences and so forth. All right, so what keeps me up at night are those, you know, all those things I just described for you. I want to just quickly go through a couple of them and with respect to the solution, where do we go next with this? Um, I think I'm pretty confident that people like Paul and others have done the research that tell us what those best practices are to work with those kids with serious emotional behavior disorders or problem behaviors. I think we have a pretty firm grip on those interventions, those programs to have a chance of having the most effect on improving the outcomes for those kids. What we struggle with is people using them the right way. What we struggle with is people using them for enough time to have the effect that they then develop to be able to produce. And they have a lot to do with those that are circled in red, around not using information for decision making, around um, responding to the, the, the crisis events that are happening around us, as well as not being scientific in their approach or focusing on implementation fidelity. So to sum that all up, I'd like you to think about it the following way. Every one of us, every one of your children, have a learning profile, a set of characteristics, a biology that affects who they are. Some of us in this room have risk factors that increase the likelihood of having difficulties navigating our environments. And those risk factors tilt us in a direction of potentially having more problems later on. But fortunately, like the work being done here at Utah, BYU, is that there are protective factors that you can fall back on to build, right? We know there are some things you can do to increase the likelihood of people with, with risk to be more successful, right? It's prevention. But the problem is, is that <clears throat> there are certain things that increase the uh, impact of those risk factors that happen to individuals. Trauma for one, shootings, 
death of family, suicide, I know that's a challenge here in Utah, you know, community family disruptions, discrimination, homelessness, all of those events increase the likelihood of those risk factors pushing the scale in the wrong direction. Now here in Utah and other states, we make it even worse because we use non evidence based practices. We exclude kids and use reactive management as opposed to being supportive of kids who have problem behaviors. Fortunately, we have some things we can do, and that's where I'm going to finish up. We're learning, I'm learning, from the people I work with, that there are some investments that we can make to shift away from, okay, to bolster those protective factors so that we can counter those risk things and trauma, traumatic events that people experience. So I'm going to quickly go through some of those. You've got to take a prevention-based approach. You've got to think of interventions within a tiered logic. It's important to use information to guide your decision making. It's important to think about professional development as being more than just pre-service, in-service, but actually an ongoing embedded professional learning community, as well as pay attention to what you do or if you met with fidelity. OK, so here's your homework assignment. I know you didn't want to have homework, but you have a homework assignment. I would encourage you to uh, go online or try to look at this particular book. There's lots of kind of summaries you don't have to combine if you don't want to. But a colleague of ours, Tony Biglin, has done a wonderful job of describing how we might improve the quality of life for our kids, families, and communities, and schools. How to make the world a better place. He does this in a language that's really accessible. It's a way to see. He summarizes best practice and evidence-based practices in a way that any of us in the room can understand and interpret and be able to put in effect. I love this book because what he's done is taken all those things that have the white column on the right-hand side and said, this is where you need to invest. Tony Bigman is a clinical psychologist in Oregon. He's one of my heroes in the sense of being able to focus on prevention as the way to go about the work. It's an easy read, but it has an important set of messages around best practices. If you don't want to read the book, pay attention to this picture. This is what he emphasizes. This is what I love about his book. This is, this is my cliff notes. This is what it would be. He describes prevention as being two important targets or objectives. One is, you got to keep the good kids good. How do we keep kids moving in the direction, right, will increase their likelihood of being successful? That's called incidence. How do we decrease the incidence of the development of problem behaviors. Really important goal for us. 80% of our kids inside our schools do just fine, basically, and it'd be great to keep them going that way. How do we make sure? But there's this other problem called prevalence, and that is, what about the kids who have high risk? What about the kids who are deeply embedded into a problem lifestyle? How do we bring them back so they can be more successful? How do we give them the strength the skills to be successful in school and communities. And that's called prevalence. It's, you'll notice that I didn't say anything about punishing kids. I didn't say anything about sending them to prison. I focused on, you know, we gotta help these kids be more successful. Again, I'm not saying there are consequences for rule violations, but we gotta start thinking about how to restore these kids to a place where they can be contributors to their social communities as opposed to be out, outcasts from the environment. What I love about Tony's work is he says there are some actionable steps you can take. It's not just about words, it's about things you can do. And he argues that one of the best things to do is teach kids the social competence, the social emotional learning behaviors to be successful in school. Teach them directly like you teach reading. Right? Basically what we do now is we assume that they're getting their social skills. But he argues, and I agree with him, that it's, it's got to be much more deliberate on our social skills instruction. And how do we increase the likelihood of kids learning that? We've actually got to do things in the environment. We've got to add stuff, we've got to take stuff away. Take away the triggers of antisocial behavior, add the triggers of pro-social behavior. Take away the consequences that maintain problem behavior, add the consequences that support pro-social skills. It's simple logic actual things that we can do. It's not just about love your children, it's about what can you do to express your love, which becomes part of the point of his book. All right, I'm gonna skip through this just because I know time's short. So one thing I've learned <clears throat> is that it's important for each one of you in the room to understand what is your learning history, 
and what are the rules you use to interpret what you see. So I'll come out. I'm a behavior analyst. I've learned from a behavioral tradition. I have used behavioral tools. I look at the world through behavioral lenses. It's not that I ignore biology. It's not that I ignore emotions and feelings. It's not that I ignore what people think. It's just that I know and feel more comfortable being able to interpret what I see, act on those interpretations, and be able to interpret what the outcomes are by taking that approach. So let me give you a concrete example about one of the challenges from our centers. So our center has been around for 20 years, and our group right, has been, I think, pretty successful internally with our 18 members, external with people like Rob and Paul and others. We, I think we've developed a pretty strong kind of community of being able to support schools. Because of our success, people think that PBIS is the solution for everything. And we've tried to make the case that it is not the solution for everything, but it's an approach that allows us to be able to understand what we're being challenged by. So at our national center, we are being asked to deal with these problems, and these problems, and these problems. So they come to me, George, George, solve these problems. You know, I'm waiting for Dandruff to show up on that list. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, I appreciate your confidence in our center, but you need to understand that we have no data to suggest that we can change the school to prison pipeline, right? Yeah, we're trying to struggle with self-injury. We know we know that suicide is a problem, and so forth and so on, but you know, how do we take on all of those at the same time? And the answer is you can't, right? You've got to be strategic about how we approach it. So our approach has been one that says, First of all, these are not equal. So let's sort them in a way that's manageable. So I put my behavioral lens on it, and we've kind of organized those in three columns. What does the student do? What do the adults do? And that's families, parents, teachers, administrators, and so forth. And what's the outcome associated with those people doing those things? Remember what Benjamin Clough said, you, know, you learn to do by doing, right? All these people are doing stuff and the experiences they have affects how they're likely to them doing it again. So for example, if you, have, if you have kids engaging bullying, what do we do? We suspend them out of school. When we send them out of school, we end up finding out that we send more kids out of school of a certain color than others. That's the outcome. We've got some kids who sell, that hurt themselves. They engage in self-injury. They're either cutting on themselves or whatever, right? What happens? We restrain those kids. And the more restraint going on inside of that classroom, the more negative that classroom environment becomes. So we've tried to say, you know, can you organize the problems into categories? And then within those categories, can you come up with solutions or approaches? If you have kids using substances, we've got a big opioid crisis going on in the Northeast and around the country, actually. You know, what do we do? We send those kids home, when they're coming to school high, and we end up with people. We send up arresting those kids, and we contribute to the school to prison pipeline. So some of our actions are actually contributing to the problems as well as solving them. But if you're careful and you look at this, this kind of analysis, if you will, your first response is, well, I get it. Let's not arrest those kids right away. Let's actually provide some rehab and some, some, some support for students to avoid that pathway. So our interventions can actually intervene by understanding what the pattern is for the problems that are occurring. Those of you that are in the room that are behavior analysts, we're just doing a functional analysis of the problem being presented at the national level. You know, how do the parts relate to each other? And this is true in the classroom, as well as the school, as well as the national level. That's the spy. So it's important for you, each of you, how many of you in the room are master students or doctoral students? Okay? None of you should have me on your committee. Because if I'm on your committee, the first thing I'm going to say when you start your program, I'm going to say, tell me your belief system for how you teach and how you understand the world. If you say you're eclectic, I'm going to say, go home and do your homework, figure out right, how you understand the world. If you're a doctoral student and you come to me with your proposal for your dissertation, I'm going to say to you, explain to me the mechanism behind the problem that you're trying to study. If you can't explain the mechanism, you can't come up with a good intervention. You have to understand why in order to understand what to do. Right? And I use my behavioral lens to accomplish that. Now, this is also why you should have me on the committee. Everybody at UConn knows me, and I'm on a number of committees. And when the, when the, at the dissertation defense, 
to the student who sends and says, my, my study is, now it's time for questions. And they all look at me, because my first question always is, can you explain the mechanism behind the results that you got? How did you get those results? How do you interpret the change? Right? How did that change come about? Right? If you can't do that, I'm going to withhold your dissertation. <laughs> you can't have it. No, it's not true. <laughs> Most people are ready for me, though. When they, you know, they start by saying, well, I come at this from a cognitive perspective. And from a cognitive perspective, this is how I interpret the problem. This is how I interpret, came up with the intervention based on that interpretation. And here's how I interpret the results from that perspective. Right? Well, I'll say, yeah, as a behaviorist, I might respond, I interpret it that way. But you pass because you were able to you know, use your perceptual frame as a way to interpret what you do. PBIS, the center I run, has a very clear conceptual theoretical framework. It comes from behavioral logic. It comes also being heavily influenced by positive behavioral support, which comes out of the developmental disabilities world, saying that you know, we've got to value the human as we build these behavioral interventions. We have to have humans involved in the interventions, because if we don't, we are imposing the interventions on others. So the participatory part of PBIS is, you know, kids, family members, community members need to be part of uh, building and interpreting the interventions we put in place. All right. So you got your homework assignment. You need to read that book, right? This is on the final. So I teach to the final. There's going to be fill in the blank item, all right? And because we're now moving into the solution side, I want you to remember the solutions more than the problems, all right? So. I live in this world called PBIX, Positive Behavioral Interventions and Support. In 1996 or so, that's when that word, those words were invented. And I literally mean invented. So when PBIS formed, we, the center became named the PBIS Center. We went off and did our work. And again, I'm bragging a little bit. We were fairly successful at the work we did. So now everybody thinks that PBIS is a thing. It's branded right, for the work that we do. So I want you to walk away from today if you remember nothing else. Remember that PBIS is not an intervention. It is not a treatment. All right? PBIS is a framework, which is that red circle. So the fill in the blank is going to be PBIS is, you're going to put framework, you're going to put process, you're going to put problem solving, you're going to put approach. Do not put intervention because it is not an intervention. And that's important for a couple reasons. One is there's no RCT on PBIS because it's not an intervention. It's a framework for doing work with students and families and so forth. We estimate that at least weekly, we get an email at our center that goes something like this. You're George Sugai, you're PBIS, right? So, yep. They say, yeah, I've got this kid, and she kicks me on the ankle on a regular basis. I need help with her. Would you please PBIS her, please? <laughs> and we respond back, there's no intervention for, called, called PBIS for ankle pain. It does not exist. But I can help you generate an intervention appropriate for that problem using a PBIS framework. Or, oh my gosh, we have 1,200 office discipline referrals right, for school violence, fights in our school. Would you please PBIS our school? And the answer is we will not PBIS your school, but we'll help you come up with a solution for that problem by using the PBIS framework. <coughs> What is that framework? It's about building a continuum that focuses on academic behavior success, and we do it with every student inside the school or classroom, not just for the kids who have problem behaviors. But most important to me is that you walk away knowing it's a framework or process. All right? So the instructors, the, the college of education people, school of education people who are in the room, this will, they're going to put this on your file, so be ready. Right? PBIS is a blank. It would be worth 75% of your points on your file. <laughs> now, so they say to me, well, big, big word framework, what are the tools that make it work? And my response is, well, there are four very important tools that make the framework operate. And I, we stole these, just like everything else we do, but we stole these. We argue that it's really important to understand that you can't solve a problem unless you have information about the problem. You need data. And those data are going to be used to be able to select the intervention. Because once you understand the problem and the mechanism, you should be able to generate a problem to try to address it. And then we argue the adults have to be competent 
and using that intervention in order for that practice to have the effect that we want. But we have to make sure that we have data that clearly defines what the outcome is that we're trying to achieve. So what is it that we want the kid to do instead of ankle picking? What is it that we want the kid to do, to do instead of using the F word? Use your words, use the appropriate words, problem solve, you know, whatever. So we need to be clear about the outcome. We need to know how bad it is by collecting data. We need to make sure that we have an intervention that aligns with that outcome. And we need to make sure that the adults are competent in the implementation. Now, that's not anything fancy. We stole that from the special ed world. How many of you in the room have participated in an IEP meeting? Lots of people hands go up. In an IEP meeting that's well run, you ask the current level of function, data. Based on this data, you write what? Short, long-term objective and goals, outcomes. And then on that piece of paper or on that computer thing, you write interventions to address those objectives based on those data. And then you hand it over to the paraprofessional and you say, paraprofessional, go do this complicated intervention. And then you wonder why the intervention doesn't have the effect that we want. I'm not saying this happens in Utah, it happens in other states, of course. And what happens is we don't have high fidelity implementation of the intervention. Because the system, the adult part, is the part that is struggling with the implementation. So let me give you a more concrete example. This is true. So this I'm not true. This is true. Alright? So in January, my mother, who's 91, calls me. She lives in California still. And she says, I'm going in. I said, where are you going into? She goes, I'm going in to have my gallbladder removed. I said, really? You're having your gallbladder removed? Great. Have you had a second opinion yet? She goes, no. I'm just going to go in next week, and they're going to remove my gallbladder. I said, really? I think you need a second opinion. You are 91 years old. What do you know about gallbladder removal? And she says, I know nothing, but I know I need to have it removed. OK? My response is, Hold on, I'm coming home. Your number one son, your only son, he is coming home to make sure this is the right decision. So we call, I call a meeting. The surgeon, my mother, my sister, you know, the security guard, they're all there for this meeting for me to ask questions about the decision that's being made. So of course I say, show me the data. And they show me the white blood counts are way up here, and the, whatever the gold letter does is way over here, and the bottle's over here, and it happens to be this great, Great, great size, you know, thing of cholesterol clogging the bile duct. Okay, I'm convinced the data are there. Right? So my next question is, well, if you do this operation, what's the outcome for a 91-year-old person having this surgery? Important outcome, right? My mother is important to me. So I want to know, tell me about what the pluses and minuses of doing this procedure on my mother. And so it's a good hospital. They say, well, here's the possibilities. We're here to do the following. This is going to give her this many years of this and whatever. But most saying, you know, time out. I don't want to hear about this, but I do. So then I say, you know, I've done my prior research. I went on Google search. I did my homework. I said, how are you going to remove the gallbladder? I turned to the surgeon. And I've done my homework, so I know the right answer. And he says, I'm going to go in the side. We're going to make these four holes. We're going to go orthoscopic. We're going to suck it out. It's going to be great, right? Out the next day, maybe it's going to be wonderful. And that was perfect, because I heard you could also open my mom's chest or stomach and do the same thing, right? But the side effects and the consequences are much greater. So check that off. You made the right choice. My doctor's a special in medicine, but I know he made the right decision, right? So then I turn to the surgeon, and I say to him, no, I lied. That's not true. I turn to her, the she, and I said to her, how many of these have you done on a woman 91 years old? And how many have died on the table? I want to know how good she is. Because why? The outcome is so important to me. I don't want her to say to me, well, I've, you know, I've done a few of these, but I'm going to turn over to my in intern and have her practice on your mother. I don't want to do that. Because the outcome is so important. Fortunately, she's a good surgeon. I actually looked her up. She's done a lot of these. Her, her success rate's really high. So they did the four things. The outcome, data, practice, systems. And so the number one side okay the surgery, and we went forward. And we had the operation and so forth, right? Because the outcome's so important. When you build bridges, when you fly airplanes, when you do surgery, when you make decisions about kid outcomes, those four things have to be considered. So our PBIS work is all about those four things. You've got to have all four. Don't just pick up an intervention because it has Paul's name on it and it's laminated. 
that's insufficient, right? You've got to be able to document that the lines with which you want, the data there to support it, and so forth and so on, and you're competent implementer in the implementation. Paul doesn't land any of this stuff. He puts in nice three ring binders there. All right. So I'm going to pass this by just the time. All right. Just a couple more things. I know we're almost done here. So I want you to understand what we mean by multi-tiered systems. And I'm going to give you a quick example, unless you another example here. So I was in Australia doing some work with the school. I was walking through this neighborhood and I saw the sign. It says graffiti hotline. Right? And then you look around, all the walls have graffiti on them. Why did they put the sign up? To inhibit graffiti writing. What's on the sign? Graffiti. Isn't that interesting, right? I'm going to argue that that's a good example of a mismatch between a problem and the intervention. Now, you could argue, and I'd agree with you, it would inhibit the wannabe graffiti writers. And I'd agree with that. But guess who they're trying to uh, address? It's the chronic graffiti writers. And the sign has no effect, except to say, oh my gosh, blank canvas. You know, I'm going to take advantage of that. And that becomes a problem for us, and how we back this stuff up. I want you to understand that there's a functional equivalent to the graffiti hotline sign in every one of our schools here in Utah, as well as around the country. And that uh, equivalent is called the discipline handbook. The discipline handbook says, serves the same purpose. And it works like this. My daughter, who was in high school, didn't even know the code of conduct existed when we would re 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 review it with her. She says, I understand, I won't do those things. My wife's son, on the other hand, he had three office discipline referrals for skipping class. And he was sent home for skipping class. <laughs> All right? But it took him three, and because he had his mother, he stopped doing those things. So at that point, my wife and I decided not to have any more kids. Because the next kid would be the kid with 14, 15, 16, 17 out of school suspension. But what are we building there? We're building a continuum. And that's what that continuum is that's part of the PBIS MTSS logic. It basically says we've got a bunch of interventions for everybody, but some of us need a little extra, and some of us need something more intensive, which is sort of the goal here. Now, so I'm going to do this fast way. Just participate with me. It's OK. Nothing will happen. How many of you in this room set an alarm clock to be here on time? It's OK. You can raise your hand. I'm not, gonna, I'm not taking notes. All right. How many of you set two alarms on your smartphone in case you slept through the first one? Thank you for being on. <coughs> How many of you called your mother last night and said, Mom, call me tomorrow morning to make sure I get up on time to get to school? How many of you have kids? <laughs> How many of you married your mom clock? I married my mom clock. She wakes me up every morning. That's an example of the continuum. Tier one is one alarm clock. Tier two is a second alarm. Tier three is marry your alarm clock. Some of us need more help in making sure we're successful. The continuum is a prevention-based model that says, how can you arrange your environment for success? We're doing the same thing with kids in classrooms and schools. I had a really nice set of data that I pass by, but. So I want you to think about why that continuum is so important. Well, the continuum and the framework and the outcomes data practice system are set up to create environments, positive climates, that have four important characteristics. Common language, common vision, common experience, and quality leadership. I think the School of Education here has been successful because you have a common vision, common language, common experience, and quality leadership to get the job done. My wife's school was successful because they had her as the principal, I have to say that. Second, common vision, common language, common experience. PBIS is building those languages, experiences, and routines for those schools to be successful. Okay. You need to kind of close out here because I have no time. So. so we are doing this work in about 26,000 schools across the United States right now, which I think is pretty cool. But our data also indicates that only 65% of them are implementing tier one with fidelity. And it drops to about 25% as you move into tier two and tier, tier three. So we have some work to do. But we've got some international sites as well. If you connect with the Dean of the School of Education or Anne here, she will give you some money to go visit these sites. Just because there's some great sites going on, but where PBIS is being implemented. All right, so to finish off, 
Bear with me, please. I really think schools are an important investment. They're probably one of the best investments we can make for supporting our kids because of their predictability and formality. So prevention is a very important kind of thing to implement in those sites. I, for me, you gotta have a conceptual framework to do your business. I'm pretty confident and comfortable with the behavioral sciences as a way to get that done. I do believe you've got to make sure you have the best interventions money to buy. And as I like to argue, you want to pick interventions that you're willing to bet your next month's salary on. If you're not willing to bet your next month's salary, I'm going to question whether or not you really believe that intervention is going to be one that's effective. The adults need the supports to be able to pull these interventions off, because otherwise it becomes very difficult. And frankly, most of the work I do is at this level, trying to get the adults to get focused on where they how they organize their resources. You gotta use information to guide your decision making. You need to be looking at that white box at the top, not the pictures, right? <laughs> the data are important for guiding your decisions. And lastly, culture's a big deal, or you might, in my language, learning history is a big deal. Because your experiences will affect how you make decisions and how you respond to what's going on around you. There's a lot of, when you pick up the materials, there's some resources that, I'm, uh, that, that I've used to kind of build this, this resource, and here's where I want to finish. So I'm going to take off my Yukon hat and throw it over here. I'm going to take off my PBIS federal grant button and put it over here. It's just me standing here because I don't want to represent those entities. After the Parkland event, a group of uh, 18 or so um, research scientists got together, uh, and we developed a statement after the Parkland event. And we made a pretty specific call for action for trying to respond. It's insufficient to make your school safer. You've got to actually get outside the school to make your school safer. And I would encourage you to take a look at the statement by these 18 folks because what it represents is a set of actions that we believe that research would say are important <coughs> for creating safe environments for our kids. Uh, I think it's great to make our schools safer. I think it's great to do threat assessments inside our schools. But it's the outside stuff that's got to change because the outside is the place that's interacting with our schools and our families. And so I encourage you to take a look at this. And again, the reason I take my hat off because it's very specific about some items, and not everybody agrees with those, but I want you to kind of take a look at how do we move this forward? And um, I love the students out of Parkland who are kind of voicing, having a voice in this because they're expressing a number of these as well about how to move forward. All right, last picture, I promise. It's a quiz for you. I've tried to make the case that you gotta be explicit. And you got to be efficient, smart, in how you make decisions. So I'm interested in seeing how you make a decision on this, ser this picture for a series here. Do you know which door to go into if you have to go to the back? I hope so. Yeah. Right? Men, women on the left, men on the right. Agreed? It's not your question. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, good. I'll assume you know. Do you know what direction to go to when you see this side? You have to look more carefully, but the arrow points that way, and you have to figure it out. Do you know which direction to go to when you have to go to the bathroom? You have to look at all the parts, the arrows, the pictures, where the location on the side is. Agree? A little more, more confusing, but you can figure it out. All right, so the question becomes, what do you? <laughs> Anybody been to the Dark Horse Inn in Boulder, Colorado? Well, you should go there. Well, not to drink, to go there. Right? Just to see the doors, if nothing else. Right? This is, these are the bathroom doors in this bar. Right? The right hand side says men, left hand side says women. Which door do you go into if you have to go to the bathroom? There's a problem, right? There's a hand pointing to the other door. And there's a hand pointing to the other door where the men is. Do you know what door to go into? No. So the Bolderites set this up on purpose. Why? Because they love it when the Utah folks make mistakes. <laughs> so they sit and watch you, and they see which door do you go into. The truth is, women's on the right, men's on the left. That's the truth. I know you still don't believe me, right? You're still saying, yeah, 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 right? But they don't teach the rule they have people figure it out and struggle with. Why? Because errors are good. In our schools, we can't afford errors. Because errors have dire consequences. We need to teach explicitly the rules. So the rule is, women's on the right, men's on the left. Follow the hand, all right? Same 
back to me, practice it, look inside, believe me, whatever. The goal here is to make sure you learn it. We don't want kids making mistakes or adults. Much of the PBIS work I do is about reducing the likelihood of errors for kids and for the adults. All right, if you want to learn more, again, Marianne has lots of money, she'll send you to San Diego next week for your PBS, or to our PBS form in Chicago in the fall. And that is the last of this. My goal was to give you some things to think about in the sense of current challenges, current landscape, current climate. I wanted to give you a little bit of background about myself as a context for how we got to where we are. I really want to emphasize the importance of individual culture in the context that we have the decisions we make. And that we've got to make sure that we pay attention to the research and guiding what we do. So with that, I'll take a deep breath, go over there and blow my nose. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you got a little bit out of this. Remember, when you fill in the blank, the answer is PBS is a okay. nice job. All right, thank you very much.